Welcome back. You're tuned in to Bazaar Morning Call, and we are coming to you live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal studio. Well, it's that time of the day when we get you a momentumizer of the day, and Manglam joins us to run us through a stock that he's picked. Morning, Manglam. Good morning. So I'm looking at JBM Auto. There was a big move on Wednesday on the stock. It was up almost 13 odd percent and with huge volumes as well, nearly four times the average trade in volumes on that stock. Then I dug deep and I realized that, you know, it's not just Wednesday. This week itself, the stock is up around 21 percent and this year it's up 51 odd percent as well. And then late last evening, we did get uh, a notification from the exchanges saying that the promoter Nishant Arya has infused funds in their EV subsidiary, EV bus subsidiary, which is uh, uh, JBM Eco Life Mobility Private Limited. And for that, they've been allotted about 17% equity. So as a result of which, the wholly owned subsidiary has now become just a subsidiary with 83% stake owned by JBM Auto and 17% owned by the promoter Nishant Arya itself. And why is this bus subsidiary extremely important for the company? Because the last time we squeezed them, they said that they are looking at some sort of fundraising in the bus business. At the same time, the bus revenue, they target a three times growth in FY24 itself with volumes actually increasing 10 times. They delivered 500 buses in the previous fiscal. This year, they are targeting 5,000 buses itself. The only uh, thing that we don't know, the price at which uh, the allotment was made to the promoter. So that's something that we need to find out. Okay, all right. Uh, Manglam, thanks a lot uh, for that. Well, the stock has seen a big uh, surge as well. Gurmeet, any view on JBM Auto? Uh uh, uh, Nigel, we have it in our universe, but we are not invested here. Uh, we'll probably track this EV news closely. Uh, what we like uh, uh, is uh, Minda. We have discussed that various times, which is Uno Minda. Another one which we are now tracking is Sandar Technologies because we uh, that's a main, uh, it's a proxy way to play the recovery in two wheelers now. Uh, so they are one of the main uh, uh, content, uh, uh, you know, additions to uh, TBS. Now they've added HMSI also. And their uh, kit value is, is growing consistently. So in, in one of the few models in TBS, it's actually gone up to almost 34, 35,000, including, uh, you know, your locks, uh, metal sheets, as well as die castings, et cetera. Uh, more prudent capital allocation. Uh, this year, probably the free cash flow generation will also on the will surprise positively. It's run up, but if you consider since IPO, uh, the valuations are still like, if you if you do the FI24 match, it would be like 19 times or something. So that's something we are tracking more right now vis-a-vis uh, -vis others. Okay, all right. Uh, Gurmeet, I also wanted to ask you about HDFC Life. You know, uh, if you're opportunistic and you bought when uh, on that budget day when the shocker came about, the stock cracked 500 rupees. Now, it's set around 650 rupees, but the street was bracing for HDFC Limited to go ahead and buy the 2.5-3% stake from the open market and make it a subsidiary. That's happened. So that support has gone out now. How do you view the stock at this price around 640, 650 rupees after it's given a return of 25% in, uh, you know, five months or so? Uh, Nigel, the IPO came uh, in the 275, 290 band, uh, went up to like, I think, 770 or something. And then I think it's been stagnant for two, three years. A uh, lot of challenges starting with COVID, high claims, and then regulatory changes. I think insurance is a very long-term secular trend. I am a personal investor since IPO. Uh, we also continue to hold it uh, in our in our portfolios in PMS. Uh, I think what is now we are seeing uh, is that now the product will be sold more on the insurance merit versus tax arbitrage and you know offering guaranteed uh, returns. Also, their n par portfolio, non par portfolio is less interested sensitive vis a vis banks. Uh, so I think that below five lakhs will stabilize. I think the street overreacted because then they initially thought the impact on the AP would be 15 20 percent. Which now, what if you see the trends in May? Uh, HDFC retail AP is grown to ten percent, and and the management is actually guiding for double digit AP growth and saying that they will be adding to the VMB margins by three to four uh, percent. And I think the trigger started when Aberdeen did a block deal uh, uh, on the I think on the last day of May. Uh, that's when the stock started moving three four percent, and then this HDFC news. Uh, you know, I personally think uh, you know insurance uh, is is a fairly stable sector. Our stock picks are are, are HDFC and I group uh, in this space. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Gurmeet, for joining in and uh, filling us in with your view on a whole host of stocks. Wishing you a good Friday ahead. Well, time to shift focus now to some sectorial calls from uh, JP Morgan. In their report, JP Morgan says that they have a positive call on steel as they expect domestic price cut cycle to end uh, soon, likely. And they also have a bit of a cautious view on cement. While on crude, 
They have cut their forecast from around $80 per barrel to around $74 per barrel. Spinnakin Parikh, Executive Director uh, Metals, as well as uh, Mining, Oil and Gas and Cement, well, joins us on the show. Hi, Pinnakin. Always good to speak to you. Well, we're going to be focusing on uh, steel, cement, as well as on oil and gas. Let's start off with steel first. You have been quite positive on it. Uh, but domestic prices, steel prices, are at a bit of a premium in comparison to imported steel. So the street is bracing by for a price cut. Could you tell us what could that quantum be? Are you baking that in? Uh, so good morning, Nigel. So we do expect a price cut in July, but our view is prob uh, that we are probably at the end of the steel price cut cycle in the domestic markets. Uh, Chinese domestic HRC export prices have fallen to $550 a ton, uh, but seem to be stabilizing at those levels for the last few weeks. Uh, and incrementally from here, news flow should improve in China. Uh, domestically, we are at the weak point of demand uh, given the monsoons, but underlying demand remains very strong. Uh, historically, we have seen that uh, in the past when domestic demand tends to be strong, uh, domestic steel prices do tend to be at a small premium uh, to imported prices. Uh, this is just because of the ready availability premium that is there. Uh, so overall, yes, there should be a price cut in July, but uh, probably we are at the end of the cycle, at least for now. What kind of a quantum we could look at? Uh, so I haven't done the numbers, but it should be a small price cut. Uh, we are unlikely to see a very large one. So at $550, the landed prices uh, out of China works out to around 53, 54,000 rupees per ton. All right. Uh, but again, uh, the other point that the street is uh, working with is prices have been, uh, you know, a, a little bit softish in line with what's going on in the globe. But the positive is that coking coal costs have declined substantially. So raw material cost is lower, though your selling price as well is lower. What kind of spreads are you working with in comparison to quarter four, say for quarter one and quarter two? Uh, g give us a brief number. Uh, sure. So at this point of time, uh, obviously for the steel companies, what has helped is the sharply lower coking coal price. Uh, however, there is a lead and lag. Uh, so essentially, um, whether it's a steel or a cement company, there tends to be a two to four month lag before the uh, spot prices flow through to the PNL. Uh, seasonally, 1H volumes tend to be lower than 2H. Uh, so there is uh, negative operating leverage which comes through. Uh, if you look at spot steel spreads, uh, essentially spot steel prices minus uh, iron ore and minus coking coal cost. Uh, implied spreads are broadly stable versus the March quarter uh, uh, at this point of time versus what the companies reported. So uh, we haven't done the numbers, uh, but it looks like uh, it's a relatively healthy operating environment for the Indian steel companies uh, versus what the markets had feared when steel prices started falling. Okay, uh, all right. The other problem is Chinese exports that spiked up to an annualized rate of closure on 90 million tons. Uh, that's a worry, right, when China starts exporting more. But do you believe that this number will get rationalized to what levels? Uh, so a couple of things over here. Obviously, the Chinese net steel export surge, uh, so we, it went from a 4 million ton monthly run rate to around 7.5 million tons in the last three months. Uh, that is a clear negative. Uh, but what we need to also keep in mind is the sharply lower steel exports out of Russia and Ukraine. So to that extent, uh, the global steel supply has not really moved as much as what uh, the Chinese net export number will suggest. Uh, second is on the margin, At some, uh, there will be some positive news flow uh, in terms of whether it's a stimulus, whether it's a, uh, you know, a set of measures which uh, positively impact demand. Uh, so Chinese steel exports uh, sequentially should be lower in the second half versus uh, what, we have seen, uh, what we have seen in the last three to four months. Uh, so that should also stabilize uh, sentiment and prices. Mm. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Pinakin, hi. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, so uh, that's uh, metals and steel uh, for, for the viewers. But, you know, in order of preference, you like metals, then you like energy, and then last you like the least liked sector is cement, and we can talk about the others as well. But just a quick word on energy and oil marketing companies in particular. Uh, you must have uh, sort of, I just want to get your views on uh, what BPC are proposing, which is uh, approval for a rights issuance. Uh, what do you make of it? I mean, uh, um, is this something sure, which is sure. going to be negative for shareholders? Is it required at this stage? Because arguably profitability has improved quite a bit. 
Uh, sure, Prashant. So we would not uh, comment on specific companies uh, and what their proposals are. Uh, overall, we do believe uh, that uh, Indian energy companies would need to step up capex uh, related to climate change. Uh, uh, at this point of time, there are not many details available in terms of what are the spending plans uh, and how do they uh, plan to go about it. Mm. No, but uh, if all all the oil marketing companies were to do it, would that change your view here? Uh, so again, since we do not have any details, right, uh, at this point of time, what we do know is that uh, the refining environment broadly remains very supportive, uh, especially given the arbitrage barrels that uh, the uh, you know, Indian companies are sourcing. Uh, implied marketing margins are also very strong. It allows companies to recoup uh, the losses that they incurred last year. Uh, it should also allow net debt reduction. Uh, so at this point of time, we have visibility on the near-term earnings. Uh, beyond the near-term capital allocation, is something where we do not have enough clarity as to how the companies will go on spending. Again, these are very long-term plans, uh, so very difficult to say uh, if there will be any immediate impact on this year or next year's financials. Mm. Uh, do you think we're likely to see a retail price cut uh, by the oil marketing companies, especially in the run-up to the elections? And if it does come through, will it hurt? Um, so at... Uh, yeah, sure. So if you look at what the gross margins are across the sector, they are at very elevated levels. There is a historical average and the companies are running far ahead of the historical averages. Uh, so at some point of time, uh, there will uh, or there should be a retail price cut. Uh, in terms of timing, uh, very difficult to say whether it is A month or B month or C month. Uh, what, uh, what we like is that uh, the companies are being allowed or the sector is being allowed to recoup the losses that they incurred last year. Uh, but there should be a normalization of prices. Uh, at some point of time uh, in the second half of this fiscal year. Okay, well, uh, we'll uh, leave it there, Pinakin. It's a pleasure having you with us here. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and uh, thank you once again for being here on CNBC TV 18 this morning. Well, there's about just five minutes to go for the uh, market opening. I just want to quickly put up uh, the asset management stocks uh, for you, uh, the HDFC, AMCs of the world and uh, the others. Nifty is indicating a 105-point uptick. Uh, HFT AMC is up 5%, uh, but I think that is the one which is seeing the maximum uh, impact of the potential <coughs> relief uh, which we discussed earlier. Nippon Life is up three quarters. UTI AMC uh, is up about 3% as well. So uh, these are the uh, AB Capital on your screen as well. And that one has done extremely well for other reasons as well. It's got other businesses. Uh, so that is down about three quarters of a percent. Well, Mitesh is with us with his 910 calls. Mitesh, good morning again. What do you have? Morning, Prashant. Uh, I would suggest a buy on Bajaj Auto. You could stop at 46.70 before targets of 48. Okay. Uh, that's uh, the 910 call on individual stocks. Let's talk about MCX. In pre open, it's currently down 10%. So it'll be a big knock is what uh, you know we should expect early in the morning. But take us through the news and the impact. So the news is now they've extended the contract with 63 Moon Technologies for another six months. Now this is the second extension that has happened. And this time the cost is going to be 125 crores per quarter, which is almost 54% higher than the previous one, which was 81 crores. Now this means that... Mo entire FI24 profitability will be wiped out because of this extension. They'll be paying out almost 150 crores in the fir uh, first half of the fiscal to, uh, for, to extend the services to 63 moons. Obviously, the brokerages are also pretty negative. Morgan Stanley has an underweight rating with a target price of 11.25. They say the extension will wipe out most of the FI24 profitability, though FI25 forecast remains unchanged, but the uncertainty could weigh on the PE. Investec has a hold rate from previously a buy rating, they have cut down their FI24 core EBITDA estimate by 92%. And Motila Loswal has a neutral rating with a target price of 1400 and they have cut their FI24 EPS estimates by 69%. Okay, thank you very much for that. Going to watch for Tata Communications as well because the company has gone ahead and acquired a US-based CPaaS company called Kailera. Uh, the cash outgo will be $100 million, but they will take on the debt of $150 million, which means the enterprise value 
stands at $250 million. The acquisition will boost the top line of the company. Remember, the company has an aspiration to double its data revenues. So with this acquisition, which has about $300 million plus in terms of top line, there is going to be a revenue boost, but margins will get diluted. Kailera had made an EBITDA loss last day of $15 million. And Tata Communication has an aspiration to have EBITDA margins of 23 to 25%. So there is going to be some EBITDA weakness. Uh, IFL today has downgraded Tata Communication to a reduce with a target price of 15.18. So watch out for Tata.com. But let's uh, get to Nimesh with a standout brokerage stock of the day. Hi, Rima. So today's standout is in delivery. Uh, Bernstein has upgraded the stock to outperform now and they have a target price of 460. Now, uh, the update is primarily on back of their positive outlook on the overall mid-cap and small-cap space, but specifically to delivery, they see a large comfort in terms of earnings bottoming out uh, with a positive operating cash flow in the near term. On back of that, they've raised the FY24 and FY25 uh, uh, earnings estimate, EBIT estimates by 25 to 60%. So after a long time, an update on delivery, Bernstein has uh, uh, upgraded to outperform and they have a target price of 460. Okay, well, uh, <clears throat> Nimesh, uh, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, Mitesh is still with us. There's, what, uh, two minutes to go, less than two minutes to go for the market uh, open. Uh, Mitesh, uh, anything else coming up on your screen looking at the pre-open? No, I think, you know, uh, I haven't really looked at the pre-open rate because I'll wait for the opening rates to come. But otherwise, I think a lot of soft bread has been very, very positive. I think it's that area which keeps on attracting me. I just heard the U.S. mention and talk about Tata Communication. I think that's on the radar as well. It's given a good pullback. And once it starts getting past uh, 1590, 1595 levels, expect the rally to about levels of 1635 to begin with. And maybe the all-time highs, highs can be clear. clear. Okay. All right, Matesh, uh, we'll touch base with you uh, in the coming hour as well to get your fresh rate as well as your call on the index. But just a few seconds actually to go before we open up uh, on the Nifty as well as the Nifty Bank. For starters, it's looking very, very good. Yet another record high is what we're looking at. The Nifty is indicating a 105-point gap up. The Nifty Bank, well, 350 points higher. So let's see how this goes. The temptation is uh, that, in fact, maybe we even go higher from here. But let's see about that. For the time being, the official rates are in. The Nifty opens up, gap up, or, or yet another record high on the Nifty. The Nifty Bank is well up, close to around 150 points. So pattern there, as the opening came in, there was some program selling that we saw both on the Nifty as well as on the Nifty Bank itself, which is a big gainer from the Nifty. Well, you have a power grid that's up close to around 2%, invoices as well as up close to around 1%. On the flip side, Bajaj Auto and Hindalco, both of them are losing out in trade. But the big stocks that you need to be focused on is the AMC companies. They are happy with what, this, uh, what the SEBI chief had to say. The TER, maybe some rationalization out there. So that's why HDFC, AMC is flying away, Nippon Life India is flying away as well. And on the flip side, MCX renewed the contract with 63 moons at 125 crores per quarter for their software smacked down 10%. Rima. Well, so MCX is the top FNO loser in the morning in terms of volumes and in terms of price. And the top FNO gainer today is HDFC, AMC, which we spoke about. But the others include Nippon Life. That's higher by close to about 3% in trade. You've got some green on the screen when it comes to TD Power. As uh, you know, Vivek and Nimesh were saying that even though the promoters want to exit, the demand is very strong um, you know, in the secondary market. So the block deal is going to get lapped up. And TD Power has opened with a gain of close to about 1.5% to 2%. On the losing side, Tata Communication has opened with a cut of 4%. Uh, this is after the company made a big acquisition of a CPAS company. The street is worried that this acquisition is going to dilute the margins of Tata Communication. Remember, even last year's acquisition of Switch that the company did was margin dilutive, and this is further going to put pressure. Credit Access Grameen, where the promoters are looking to sell 5 to 6% stake, has opened with a cut of 2.5%. Aurobindo Pharma, there was news about a Form 4A3. ISEC has seen some profit booking. Um, earlier in the week, remember, it had rallied on news about the deal listing. Yesterday was the board meeting. Share swap ratio announced, and the stock is down close to about 3.5%. Some cuts seen on Voltas. Uh, opening in the red. Uh, you've also got green on the screen when it comes to PPCL. But all in all, uh, good opening, right? Building on the strength, 100 points higher in the cash market on the Nifty. Sensex up close to about 400 points. Advanced decline ratio is looking good. Five stocks in the green right now for one in the red. <clears throat> you know, it's, a, it's a, a crazy market, right? You've got large blocks coming, but instead of uh, stocks opening at a big discount or anything, I mean, <laughs> stocks actually opened higher. 
uh, you know what uh, is just uh, that, that that kind of market and it's also that kind of a market where we're not talking about what's happening in Asia right since morning we've hardly you know taken a check on Asia because Indian markets have so much momentum that irrespective of what's happening in the Asian yeah. screen it matters of course but it's not the sole driver it's 2021 again <laughs> <laughs> so who cares what's happening in the US and uh, Asia etc but uh, you know uh, when you get too much on that side, one side, I mean, you know, you got to pull back a little bit mentally. Just a, a couple of names, uh, Nigel, and throw, throw it to you. Uh, so, HDFC AMC, look at that. I mean, HDFC AMC is up 9%. Uh, it's got huge volumes. I mean, it's right there on the up, uh, on the uh, top of the sort of board there, 2,225 on HDFC AMC. And I think there are some blocks, etc. Maybe we'll put that uh, put that out. Manapuram is, uh, you know, the recent low was 120 around there, but it's rallied now about to 133. Uh, we've got uh, Suzlon, which is coming up with very large volumes. It's uh, you know crossed nearing 16 rupees now, actually middle uh, middle of 15 and 16. Power Grid is up about 2.6. 63 moons we mentioned. Uh, Nippon India is coming up a little bit. UTI AMC. But those are in the 3 and 4% range, but picking up for sure. Uh, and you got Nucleus, which is up about, uh, I think, about 1.5% as well. So this is, you know, the uh, gainers list uh, out there. Uh, big uh, volumes on Adani transmission as well. Yeah, I mean, actually, cool. huge volumes. This, uh, it's a 3% cut on Adani transmission. I think we're at about, what, 797 or so uh, on uh, that one. Ease My Trip is another one. Credit Access is down. And I think there was that block on credit access as well, 3% lower, 1287, 1288 on credit access. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that uh, Adani transmission, mm. large trade, 40 yeah. lakh shares odd have uh, changed hands. Also yeah. keep an eye out on Suzlon. That's up close to around 5%. You have uh, ICIC Security as well. They have come out with a buy rating and they have a target price of around 22 uh, rupees. So that explains why massive volumes stock up close to around 6%. Odd. But uh, Mir Bora joins us in the studio. Hi, Mir. It's a rainy morning. Yeah, <laughs> really, but a happy morning. Yeah, that's good. And the markets and, and are you making made it here, so. <laughs> and the markets are Thank making uh, fresh all-time highs, and obviously portfolios are feeling good as well. But Mihir, what do you think about the headline index from year on? You know, before we discuss about various themes, uh, given that we are at around nineteen thousand, we could easily do another five percent from here. But do you think in the next, say, twelve to eighteen months, or the upside on the headline index could be capped, given the valuations, given that we're getting into an election year? Uh, the Fed, I'm not sure what they're going to do next. Uh, so given all of that, do you think upside on the Nifty could be capped? Uh, it may be capped, but it's still a healthy you know, outlook in the mm. sense that the index has actually done nothing almost for 15, 18 months, right? And earnings in the meantime have grown by 15, 17%. Expectations are another 15% growth for the next couple of years. Mm. So given that we expect good earnings growth for the Nifty as a whole, and valuations are at a little above long-term averages, about 19 times on a forward basis. Yes. Remember, in, in, in 2022, early 2022, we were trading at almost 23, 24 times yes. on a forward basis. Now we are down to almost 19 times. So valuations have time corrected. Uh, the large in indices have la time corrected. Probably a little bit froth on the small cap and mid cap uh, front, but nothing to worry about. So I would expect normal, when we say 10 to 12 percent kind of returns from the large cap indices. Okay. Uh, what are you doing, Mir? That's what we want to know. What, what exactly? What is the new thing you're doing? Or are you happy sitting on what you have, what you own, and uh, that's doing just fine? Uh, trying to pick, pick stocks, obviously. Uh, that's what, what you need to do. Mm. But in general, the broad theme that we've you know, discussed many times, that the domestic sector is definitely doing much better than the global. Plus the government-linked segments like infrastructure, road building, railways, defense, uh, is working. I think the big call that one needs to take is what happens in China. Mm. Uh, whether China comes up with another big stimulus, which can potentially impact metals and global growth. Mm. Uh, but apart from that, I don't see too many risk factors to the domestic theme. Mm. Uh, uh, the, the exporters like IT, etc., we're still underweight. But the way US is not going into a recession, I would say, mm. uh, it also may be an attractive bet at some point in time. But we would wait to see the hiring numbers and some big, uh, you know, announcements for order wins, etc., for some of the large companies. You know, when one looks at blocks data and what uh, H and I, etc., are doing, I mean, you're an institution, institutional investor. Uh, what one is sensing is that people are willing to go down the market cap curve to look for that extra uh, yes. sort of delta, yes, extra that's the juice, fro frothy part of the market. <laughs> now. Yeah, but uh, so what do you make of it? I mean, is it <clears throat> is it going to be? And we're seeing good, credible names. I mean, you know, in lots of these uh, yes. sort of smaller companies. Uh, small caps is past it, micro caps now. What's your sense? 
so we're sticking to mid and large mostly. Small caps, we have probably about 10% exposure in some of the funds, 5 to 10%, not much. Uh, and in the blocks, probably we participate in one or two out of 10. You know, So it's not like we're participating in everything. We're still being choosy about valuations. Mm. But do you know why uh, these promoters, investors are you know, just checking out right now, selling so extensively? Is it just opportunistic? And then shouldn't it make investors wary, right, that they don't have the confidence to stay put at these levels? See, some of them are known exits because a lot of the PE and VC funds which invested three to seven years ago, they have a shelf life. They have a shelf life. They have to exit. And for most of the uh, consumer tech, the, the, the ones that got listed about a year and a half ago, we knew that these, these blocks are going to come after one, one and a half years. So that's not a surprise. Yeah. Promoter selling is there, but I don't think it's at an alarming or extraordinary level. So I think at some level, promoters will want to buy a bungalow in Newtons or something like that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, me and on the positive front, we'll say the depth of the market as well has improved, right? The kind of selling that we're seeing is getting absorbed. I mean, I think your phone must be buzzing uh, nonstop with the kind of uh, large trades we're seeing, and a lot of them taking place even in the pre market, which is safer. Yeah. There's no scope of slippage. Uh, I want to ask you about this power theme. It's come back and it's come back in style. Now you could play it various ways. Uh, the Genco's uh, overdues have come down, so you could play the financers, you could play smart meters, you could play renewable. Uh, how are you all approaching this space? Because there's a lot of excitement out there and various themes to play it as well. So we're still playing it mostly to gen sets. Uh, the thermal theme is, is used to be the big theme. That's not no longer a theme. Mm. And in the renewable space, frankly, there are very few listed companies that one can participate in. Mm. You know, so the big action is happening in solar. Very few companies which are, you know, direct exposure or indirect exposure to solar. Yeah. And probably even if they are there, probably they have some of them have debt issues and, you know, uh, legacy issues. Yeah. Uh, so apart from utilities, there are very few plays, frankly, in the, in the power space because thermal is still not a big theme. Uh, thermal is not a big, uh, big theme. Financials, uh, Mihir, especially NBFCs, uh, how much exposure do you have there? Are you increasing exposure to the uh, NBFC space? Yes, uh, significantly much more than, uh, significantly more than what we used to have, say, six months ago. Mm. Uh, uh, especially, you know, in the in the private sector, NBS of course, mm -hmm. not so much in the in the public sector or. You know. And which, uh, uh, what kind of housing finance or is across it? the board? Uh, mm -hmm. What we are seeing is that uh, essentially retail uh, lending continues to uh, gain traction. Mm -hmm. uh, there are still no any alarming signs of NPAs building up in those pockets, mm -hmm. and margins happen to be some of the best, you know, mm -hmm. especially in the low affordable housing and those kind of segments. Mm -hmm. Whether you talk about gold, affordable housing even unsecured credit if, if done the right way. Mm. Some of the fintechs are now actually plays on uh, you know, uh, retail lending. Mm. So those kind of themes are still building up. I think uh, there is a bit of a penetration story here. Mm. And the trigger for us to increase exposure to NBFCs was basically the drop in funding cost or at least the worst of the tightening behind us. Is, is it a call on scale? Because I mean, say for example, for an uh, HDFC bank to go from whatever, 15, 20 lakh crores to 40 lakh crore book is going to be harder as compared to Bajaj Finance to go from 4, 5 lakhs to 10 lakhs. I mean, is that the call or is it purely tactical rates coming off so NBFCs benefit more? I think it's more. I, I, I think we have given up trying to predict the end of the growth for the larger banks because I think some of the banks have continued to grow. Because even a year back, the call years, was yeah, why yeah. go down the curve because large banks are available at decent valuations. Correct. But then the valuation differential became quite sharp mm. because private sector banks did quite well mm. and mm. NBFCs were almost available at one time book. Even the private sector NBFCs were available at one time book. Mm. So there was a bit of a valuation catch up in any case mm. and plus the funding cost trigger. By the way, HDFC AMC is now up 10% right now. Uh, so it's uh, getting very close to its 52-week high. I think the 52-week high on HDFC AMC is 2,314, hit on 20th of December of last year. And the stock currently is at 2,250, so about 65 points away, 3% away on HDFC AMC. Look at that move on the stock. Do you think the regulatory overhang on H the AMC companies may now be behind, given what the developments over the last two days, that even if we get the second TER, a new proposal based on the, you know, the second proposal that comes through, it's not going to be as stringent as what the market was fearing. So do you think the worst of the regulatory headwind from AMCs is behind and stocks are attractive? Hopefully, uh, because the... But you're AM not convinced, you're saying hopefully. Hopefully, because, you know, regulatory, we need to wait for the final draft in any case. Uh, but valuations in this space had been beaten down. Uh, some mm -hmm. of the other capital market link stories were also you know, beaten down. For example, some of the brokerages, AMCs, they're, they're all trading at, you know, much cheaper valuations than what they used to 
trade about a year and a half ago. So mm -hmm. there is a bit of a value play to here. So mm -hmm. you would buy right now? Would you recommend adding on to positions, buying? Uh, uh, yeah, in the sense, if it's a value buy, why not? Yeah. What about how you're approaching this final financialization themes? You know, AMC as we discussed, there are exchanges out there. Uh, you know, BSE suddenly it appears it's coming back into the limelight. You know, after a while, doing the right things, getting some bit of regulatory support as well. You have MCX that unfortunately they have promised, but they have not been able to deliver, and that's been a big negative because the street was factoring that. And you have the unlisted NSE, which you is have depositories at, too. Uh, depositories as yeah. well. So yeah, so how 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 would you play this financialization of savings or uh, the stock markets as well, how do you play it? Uh, that's a theme that has to, you know, secularly grow, frankly yeah. speaking. And uh, I mean, you can pick and choose whether you want to be in an AMC or a brokerage or a, Are you all a playing depository. It? We have some exposure, not with, not very high. So far, most of the, because as an insurance company, there are limitations on sector exposure. So banking itself and NBFC itself becomes so big yes. that, you know, to add other financials becomes okay. a bit of a sector constraint. Correct. Uh, what else, Mir? I mean, any smaller, smaller sector where you think, uh, I mean, it's still, you know, lesser valued than it should be, where there is opportunity. Uh, I mean, in the mid cap and large cap space, where you're comfortable. Sure. So construction capital goods continue uh, to surprise on the. Upside. I heard you say construction, but yeah. you're talking about road contractors or uh, uh, no, even buildings. Even okay. The private sector, uh, capex in buildings, real estate. Uh, I mean, when I talk about buildings, I talk about office complexes as well as industrial buildings, mm. uh, hotels, mm. uh, hospitals is a big space, uh, a lot of action happening from the government side mm. in hospitals. Uh, if you look at some of the companies, they've got huge, uh, because government has announced a lot of a aims, etc. and a lot of work is happening in buildings. Mm. So I would say roads, uh, buildings, infrastructure, that's one. Mm. And, and this, they the, stick with, uh, because there are lots, I mean that space is as... It's all mid caps, it's, it's all mid and small caps, uh, okay. you know, uh, so you have to really pick and choose there. So, be, so without naming names, I'll name names, I mean, uh, uh, so, you know, there's KNR and there is, uh, you know, what are, it's a long line of uh, companies, you're talking about those kind of companies so if or... You, if you look at the quality so far filter, mm. uh, in our list there are probably three or four, frankly, okay. which pass the quality test, I would, okay. I would say. Okay. And then... The, the surprising part or the positive surprise over the last uh, few quarters has been you don't see big bank project announcements. There's no major steel plant announced or you know fertilizer plant announced. But still, private sector capex is picking up, mm. <coughs> which means is the small small units which are setting up capacities across sectors, whether it's pharma or electronics or textiles, ethanol, sugar, uh, ethanol, sugar, sugar. a lo lot of lot of things happening in the MSME uh, segment, which is adding up to all this capital expenditure. Mm. So cap goods also, I think, continues uh, to surprise on the positive side. We had the management of Thermax joining us, exactly making the point that you're making right. that that's the. Uh, not, it's not lumpy, it's, yeah, it's not lumpy, orders, correct. but which also makes it much more sustainable, Sustain. hopefully. Absolutely. By the way, NBFCs are on fire today. Indebles Housing Finance, 4.3% up. m and Financial, 4% up. Mannapura, Max Financial, uh, go down the curve as well. Uh, you're seeing some big, big moves in very large uh, volumes. Um, on the losing side, Tata Communication has trimmed some of its losses. It was down close to about 5%, is now down, I think, 1.7%. Pull up Tata Communication as well. Revenue boost, but there will be some slip coming through on uh, the margin front. Mihira, what about pharmaceutical? There was a lot of interest in pharma when the index was close to its 52-week low. It had started rebounding. In fact, it was the first sector to lead the rally. But now again, in the last one month, we're not hearing too many people to, you know, coming out and say, buy now, buy now. Where do you stand on pharma and the individual subsectors in that? So valuations uh, are attractive. Still. Uh, the call on pharma, I think, will be whether generic pricing pressure in the U.S. has bottomed out. Uh, and if that happens, then can, there can be a big re-rating of the sector. I guess why, why pharma is probably not in the limelight over the last mm. few weeks is because there's so much action happening elsewhere. Okay. You may want to, uh, Ramir, thank you very much for joining us, but uh, you may want to listen to the next conversation we have. We have, uh, you know, the Minister of State for IT and Electronics joining us, Rajiv Chandrasekhar. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of the stuff that you were talking about, manufacturing, capital goods, construction, I think... Uh, uh, sort of plays right there. Now, uh, one of the big fundamental uh, drivers for the optimism around India uh, is basically uh, the government thrust, government of India thrust, uh, asking companies to make in India, basically getting global companies to manufacture and set up uh, manufacturing bases and factories in the country. And this has, of course, got huge multiplier effect on the economy. From PLIs to semiconductors to, I mean, large global corporations like Apple uh, announcing aggressive expansion plans, hopefully it seems to be all coming together. We have Rajiv Chandrasekhar, uh, Minister of State for IT and Electronics, joining us. He's, of course, spearheading many of these initiatives. Uh, Rajiv, good morning. 
Uh, great to have you with us here. Thank you very much for your time, Prashant, this side. Uh, I just want to start with, uh, <clears throat> you know, the PLI schemes. And I want to actually focus our conversation on these three areas. One is, of course, PLIs. The second is semiconductors. And uh, the uh, third, of course, is w what's happening with Apple, the largest company in the world, and what they've stated, which is having 25% of manufacturing out of the country. But let's just start with PLIs. Uh, big program. Uh, being run consistently for the last uh, a few years since it's been announced. By when, Rajiv, do you think we'll, be, uh, we'll start to see the benefits of PLI coming through uh, in FDI numbers? You know, like uh, uh, what we saw back in the 90s with China. That'll, that, that's basically going to be the big thing when that starts to happen. Or are you starting to see signs of it already? Go on. Oh, absolutely. I think uh, the signs are uh, are there uh, for those who are looking. And certainly these plants that have come up today, we have large world-class plants that have come up uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu, in Karnataka, in Noida, in, uh, in other parts of the country. Uh, and certainly there is, in my opinion, we have reached a stage or inflection point almost where there is critical mass around uh, electronics manufacture, specifically currently in the smartphone segment. Uh, and uh, that is uh, creating jobs that's caused investments to come in. And more importantly, I think the almost absence, total absence of India in the global value chains of electronics, uh, which was the case in 2014, is now being transformed into where India is slowly and steadily increasing its share and presence on these electronics GVCs. And as you know, G the electronics GVCs apart from hydrocarbons, they are the second most uh, traded uh, commodities in the world today. At, uh, the global trade of electronics is about 1.6 trillion. And so uh, our presence today is certainly a far higher presence, a far more significant presence than in 2014. All the major brands are uh, certainly in India today and exporting. Um, both Samsung and Apple, the big brands, and then there is a slew of other brands that are smaller brands, uh, including China, Indian brands. So I think uh, we are at a stage where the PLI for smartphone has uh, certainly translated into a very successful one, creating jobs, investments, and uh, increasing share of the GVCs of that category. Mm. Uh, morning, sir. So I believe mobile phone exports from India crossed $11 billion last year, doubling compared to the previous year. What could that number look like in FI24? And secondly, we've got Apple, which has announced big grand plans, uh, you know, for uh, setting up shop in here in India. Uh, are there proposals from other smartphone manufacturing companies to set up base here? Look, the two biggest global brands in smartphones, as you know, are Apple and, Smart, uh, and Samsung. Uh, both of them have very, very significant presences in India. Samsung directly and Apple through its network of EMSs, Foxconn, Vistron, Pegatron, uh, the, the, the network of companies that manufactures for them. And uh, they are already here. Uh, and, and they are really now focused on growing their volumes and growing their exports. We have last year crossed 1 lakh crores in exports, which is a significant number, considering that in just eight years ago, we were uh, not just not exporting, we were almost importing 82% of all smartphones consumed in India. So it's a dramatic transformation and a dramatic expansion, both in terms of investments and volumes and exports in this particular category. The other important thing to watch out for uh, and this has been part of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's strategy is as the volumes pick up in the original category, that is the smartphone in this case, the underlying supply chain components and all of these feeder industries that feed into this uh, very complex and sophisticated supply chain are also beginning signs uh, to show investments and growth in India. So a lot of the supply chains that have traditionally existed outside of India are also showing signs of moving to India. So uh, I think uh, we are at a very, very good place uh, and there's a tremendous amount of tailwind for this category of uh, products in electronics, which is a smartphone category. Uh, so do we have the numbers of what the smartphone exports were in the first quarter of FI24? I, I don't have the exact numbers with me and so I don't want to speculate, but certainly we are on track to cross last year's by uh, at least 
as I understand it, at least by a factor of 35 to 40 percent. Last year, we were one lakh uh, crores of exports. Uh, it, smartphones are already the top five exported products from India today. So they've, we've already crept into the top five as a category of exports. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers. There is obviously a certain lag be between uh, when the uh, companies report the exports and uh, when we get it. But uh, I think we are on course to do a 40%, 35 to 40% growth in exports at a very minimum. Uh, Rajiv, one of the things which uh, uh, you know, some uh, point out is that with uh, assembly, we are actually capturing the last one and a half, two percent of the total value of the phone. Uh, so, uh, what's the plan? I mean, will will this, with what we have now, will this eventually do... Uh, do you have visibility that this, this will lead to both backward and forward integration? I'm assuming that is the plan, right? Uh, to get companies to make here and not just assemble here. Yeah, which is the point. I, I, look, in the smartphone in the smartphone category, the uh, making and the assembly are the same. Uh, what you are referring to is really the underlying sophisticated supply chain that creates the various parts that go into the end product, the display, the semiconductors, the PCBs, the discrete components, et cetera, et cetera. What is happening today is not just assembly as in just putting it together and just packaging it and putting it out of the, sh out of the factory. There is uh, the whole ma manufacturing of the PCB, populating the PCB, uh, testing the phone, testing the PCB. There is a significant amount of value that is being added in what you refer to as the assembly process, and I refer to as the manufacturing process. And the strategy, to explain the strategy to you, the design of the PLI was aimed as a, a, as a two-step uh, game. First, to just create the volumes for the product, the actual original equipment. And then as the volumes reach a critical scale, that creates an incentive for the supply chain, the components uh, ecosystem, also to relocate, to invest and manufacture in India to supply this. So I think the first phase of creating a credible presence, a trusted presence by India-made products in the global value chains has been more than established and has very successfully been met. And now the focus on the part of the government is to move the PLI impact into the ecosystem around the actual product, which is, like I said, you can see one piece of it is semiconductors, which you have already seen being rolled out and in play. And you will see now increasingly other parts of the component ecosystem also relocate to India from other jurisdictions or set up ab initio capacity in India. Hi, good morning, Mr. Chandrasekhar. Uh, you know, sir, since you mentioned uh, the semiconductor issue, I want to know what is the status update of that uh, Vedanta Foxconn uh, push out there? You know, they have reapplied, I think, the 28 uh, NM node is what they have uh, put out out there. So could you tell us, as of now, how do things stand and where are we in terms of approvals? Look, on the, uh, on the semiconductor uh, space, there is a great deal of progress that has been made in the last 18 months across the ecosystem. So on design and innovation side, there has been tremendous amount of progress. We have almost 30-odd startups today that are creating next-generation devices and uh, chips. Uh, we have, on the talent side, made a lot of progress. We are... Uh, just finishing the design and the final I's and uh, T's being crossed on the research facility in Mohali. And on the fab and manufacturing front, you've, announced, you've seen the announcement for the Micron assembly plant that will be in Gujarat. It's a very, very big uh, decision, very big investment in terms of strategic value. It's a memory player. And we see that as being value adding and adding to the products in smartphone and the IT hardware servers that are being manufactured in India and will be manufactured in India. On the fab, to your specific question on Vedanta Foxconn, they have chosen to reapply in a much more mature node, which is a 40 nanometer uh, uh, product category or device category. The 28 nanometer, they are, I think, they have been unsuccessful in terms of creating a technology partner or a technology alliance, which is obviously the critical part of a fab. And they have now reapplied as a 40 nanometer, more mature node, uh, much more stable and uh, higher yield uh, technology. We are studying it. The proposal was only submitted a few days ago. We will study it and see if it meets uh, our requirements of being a viable and credible uh, proposal. And we will take our view on that uh, with the help of all the external advisors that are part of the advisory board. 
Rajiv, uh, just a couple of more questions on the semiconductor bit. I mean, so Micron has been the first application which has been approved under the Semicon scheme. Uh, so on that, right, uh, again, I mean, as Summer pointed out that... Uh, uh, the company is only putting in about $800 million out of the 2.75, which is the total cost. The rest will be borne by the center and the state. Uh, uh, what's, what's, the, what's the plan? I mean, of course, the government had laid out a $10 billion incentive plan, and I'm assuming that is precisely for, uh, uh, for, for this kind of uh, thing. Uh, is the intention that once companies make here, there is the demonstration effect as well. It attracts more companies to come. So you've got to give that initial thrust. Go on. Oh, absolutely right. You are absolutely right. For the last 74 years, India has uh, really not uh, had any presence in the semiconductor space. We are currently in an extremely competitive environment with the US Chips Act, the Europeans with their Chip Act, the Japanese with their aggressive uh, incentive programs to attract uh, semiconductor investments. So we are operating in a global environment where there is a lot of competition to attract these types of investments. And therefore, the government of India in December 2021 came up with this proposal where 50% of the capital investment made will be uh, supported by a capital grant from the government of India. And uh, Micron, which is certainly one of the biggest names in the memory space. And as you know, in any device today, any electronics device, it is really logic and the memories that constitute the silicon the semiconductor uh, uh, population. So I think uh, in that sense, it is a very important strategic investment for us. We believe that this investment will, in a sense, catalyze the uh, ecosystem for manufacturing, packaging, testing, and verification going forward. And I must point out to you one thing for those who probably don't uh, haven't understood this or picked this up, that packaging is about as critical to drive performance and innovation in future products and devices as much as semiconductor manufacturing. So semiconductor packaging is also a force multiplier for performance. And so therefore innovation and packaging around innovation, uh, innovation around packaging is also a very critical element of the ecosystem that is being built today in India. So just, uh, you know, one more point about that December 21, uh, you know, the semiconductor program that the government had laid out. Uh, it didn't really take off, right? Uh, Vedanta Foxconn didn't find the technical partner. ISMC partner was acquired by Intel. IGSS, which was one of the applicants, uh, I don't think they met the requirements that the government had in mind. Um, and then you all came out with another program. As you pointed out, this space right now is very competitive with the CHIP Acts in US and EU. So what's the you know government doing on that front? Look, <laughs> I think... Uh... I think, uh, I, mean, I mean, at the risk of uh, busting that bubble of cynicism, uh, let me say this. Nobody who sets out to build a semiconductor ecosystem believes it's something that happens in a snap. It is a fairly complex ecosystem to build, especially for a country like ours, which has really done very little in the last 70, 74 years. And so, therefore, we've always seen this as a multi-year roadmap that we are building. It is certainly not about instant gratification or instant headlines. I, I can certainly say that maybe we, sh we uh, should have uh, uh, kept the window open initially for more than 45 days. That was maybe a tactical mistake that we made. And so the first round of proposals was certainly proposals that were, uh, uh, that were, for example, the IGSS proposal did not cut muster with our technical advisory group. And so we've reopened the window. And like I said, I don't see this as something that is going to have only short-term goals. This is really a medium to long-term play about building an extremely competitive, innovative semiconductor and electronics ecosystem that in turn becomes a part of the global semiconductor and electronics value chains that is currently, as you know, very clearly is going through a process of being redrawn and redesigned as post-COVID people look for alternate uh, destinations for their products and, uh, and their uh, uh, devices. So I think uh, I don't see this as uh, uh, anything but a natural process of being patient and building this ecosystem with focus and determination, which the Honorable Prime Minister has uh, signaled from uh, December 2021. The money is there, the capability and the intention of the government is there. And I think the world is currently certainly looking at India as a very, very attractive destination, both from a market as well as from an innovation and manufacturing hub point of view.
Right, and we wish you all the best. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rajiv, for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure, and uh, we hope to have many more conversations along the way as uh, efforts are on to build that uh, sort of ecosystem for, for semiconductors here. Uh, first steps taken, first company, uh, and uh, their plans with Micron approved by the cabinet. Well, we'll take a very quick commercial break here with the news that the markets are doing just fine. We have the management of Birla Corporation joining us next. The company's been a big winner, surging nearly 40% in F524 so far already. After that, we have the management of Karnataka Bank to discuss the growth and business outlook. Stay tuned. The conversation coming up next. Well, time for our first corporate uh, on the show, Bidla Corp. That's one of the big winners this year. Stock has surged nearly around 40% in trade in F524 so far. I mean, only a quarter in there. To understand how, what, how things shaping up, Mr. Sandeep Ghosh, the managing director as well as chief executive officer of the company, joins us on the show. Hi, good morning, sir. Thanks so much for joining in. Well, your stock price has been rocketing, and clearly there's a lot of interest for a large-sized company like yours on an EV per ton. Well, they're still trading pretty attractive at around eighty dollars per ton. Want to understand a couple of aspects first on the demand front. You know, reports indicate that demand has been quite strong. So, could you tell us what was industry growth, demand growth like in the first quarter, and also how much better have you all grown in comparison to the industry? Go ahead, sir. Mr. Sandeep, oopsie. All right, I think we'll have to, uh, you know, reconnect uh, with Mr. Sandeep in just a bit. But clearly, that's been one of the big, big gainers. Um, so we'll try to get more clarity in terms of, uh, you know, what's the view. Yeah, just the last few months, up more than 25%. The move actually started in April. And now the street is baking in a better performance that's likely to come about in the coming quarter. All right, I think he's back with us. Uh, hi, sir. Good morning, uh, Mr. Sandeep. I hope uh, our audio is reaching you now and we're audible. Yeah. yeah, thank you Lovely. so much. Lovely. So I was just congratulating you because your shareholders would be quite happy. In the last few months, your stock price is up 35 to 40%. So I wanted to understand that how has demand shaped up for the industry in the first quarter of this year? And how much better have you all grown in comparison to the industry? Thank you very much for having me over and giving Billa Corporation the uh, platform to talk to you. Uh, first of all, the congratulation, I think, uh, uh, should uh, deserve to the investors, uh, you know, who have placed their faith in us, their confidence in us. We as management uh, do our job, try to do our job to the best of our abilities, and we are happy if that is being uh, reflected in our uh, share values as well as our, uh, you know, <clears throat> investors are getting rewarded for it. Uh, so that's a matter of satisfaction. Now, to answer your question specifically, industry volume growth has been, I think, quite healthy. Uh, we have been projecting during for the year about uh, everybody's prediction seemed to be that it will be in the high single digits, 8 to 9%. Uh, first quarter, though, the growth, uh, I, we reckon, has been in uh, uh, double digits. And we have kind of grown um, at par or thereabouts of the market. You see, we are not really uh, having um, a huge... Uh, capacity expansion, so we'd be happy to grow uh, with uh, the market or marginally ahead of it, and that's what we are doing. Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the issue which will remain throughout the year is on pricing. Although there is, uh, you know, there's a, a, a softening on the cost side, because obviously for fuel, uh, one doesn't see prices really going up, but at the same time, one would be worried uh, for prices slipping. And therefore, mm. we will look at the coming quarter with caution because that's the monsoons, how things 
uh, shape up, though there are certain other tailwinds which might help. Um, so that, that's, mm. that's the balance. But one is happy mm. between the healthy mix, between the healthy growth of um, volume, and as mm. long as price hold, uh, it's, I think, a fair deal. Uh, so why do you think there is a risk that prices may come down? If volume growth is in double digit, commodity prices are largely stable, uh, what could lead to this uh, cut in prices that you fear? No, the, see, there are two things. One is when I mentioned is the monsoon. You know, that during the monsoon season, you do have a slackness in demand. But at the same time, I said there are certain tailwinds as well, because the kind of interest spending which is happening you would have been reporting the growth one is seeing in real estate and housing right now. Mm. We expect with the elections uh, down the <clears throat> uh, line in the year, both the state elections in uh, some major states plus the uh, you know looks of elections coming less than a year down the line, you will have yes. a lot more spend on projects like Pradhan Mantri, Avas Yojana and the rest of it. So those are good tailwinds. Uh, mm. But one uh, jury on the monsoon is still out. It's one is the absolute volume of monsoon, then the spatial distribution and how it affects uh, crops in various regions. But so far, the story has been, I think, encouraging. All right. You know, the last time uh, Bidla Cop spoke to us, uh, Mr. Sandeep, uh, the guidance that was given was volume growth will be closer to around 15% for this year. That's FI24 on the whole, with a bit up per ton hovering around 850 rupees per ton. Now, uh, we have a fourth into the year. I don't want to ask you about this current quarter, because obviously you're in silent period. But for the year, do you think those numbers are gettable? Volumes 15% higher, a bit up per ton, 850. Uh, we kind of um, uh, stick to those guidance because you mm. see, our volume growth uh, mainly will come from our new commissioning of the Mukudban assets, which is near yes. Nagpur, new plant. And the ramping up is going on well and uh, it's going according to plan or maybe ahead of um, our expectations. And if the mm. market in that region uh, you know, uh, holds up. And if we mm. see um, uh, profitability in the market, uh, uh, there are two aspects. I'm quite confident the volume growth will come in any case, but then it will be a good boost to our bottom line because th there we have a lot of fiscal incentives which will start kicking in and that's going to be beneficial for our bottom line. All right. Mr. Sandeep, you know, we don't get to speak to you very often, but what's the view on the jute business? Why don't you just get rid of it? I mean, uh, is it going to be taking... Uh, yes? Jute is, uh, holds a lot of promise for the future. And okay, so you're positive on that. Uh, where do, how do you see that business shaping up, sir? See, there are two parts to it. What I was just now telling you, I think Jute has a lot of promise, not just for us, for the country as a whole. I am personally disappointed um, you know, uh, that the country has missed an opportunity in not including Jute in the PLI because it's a geo fabric. Jute would have been a great industry, and I think it's the opportunity missed even by the state government and the industry per se. That would have been a fantastic opportunity to turn around that industry, because today the demand for geofabric and eco-friendly eco fabric across the world, uh, it is just um, booming. And unless we change our technology here, uh, produce, uh, innovate, produce better designs, new kind of um, uh, products, uh, uh, you know, we really will we'll be missing the um, bus in the international market. So there is a huge opportunity there, and there is so much individual people can do. As far as we are concerned, we are making our small steps in that direction. Our jute exports of value-added products has increased, and we are, um, you know, expanding in that market. We're trying to find niches like, uh, you know, coffee beans uh, is one um, product where. Uh, but jute is used exclusively. So we are going into international markets in Latin America, in uh, uh, Asia, East Asia, uh, uh, where uh, you know jute is being used. We are going in for shopping bags of uh, high-end um, uh, you know uh, supermarket chains and people who are moving into that. But that's as I was saying that there is so much we can do as individual because it's not been a very profitable industry. But I think it has promise and it should be. Uh, both a fallacy or a mistake for a company to shed it, as well as I think we'd be dis doing a disservice to the national cause if a company like ours, which has been 100 years in this business, were to shed it just because um, you know, right. it's uh, maybe too small in the scheme of things. But uh, to right. add to it, it gives us a healthy bottom line for the size of this business.
<clears throat> Got it. Absolutely. I take that point, sir. And well put. Thank you very much for joining us. Good speaking with you here on CNBC TV 18. Thanks indeed. Well, I just want to quickly highlight, look at Nippon India. Uh, that stock, I mean, it was almost as if uh, for the first 10 minutes of trade when we opened, uh, it kind of forgot about the fact that there is perhaps some potential relief on TER regulation. And then it woke up. Woke up. It's up 14%. It's basically surpassed. It's, a, uh, it's kind of a late uh, <coughs> reaction, a later reaction, I should say. But 14% uh, on uh, Nippon India at the high, not quite at the high point of the day, but pretty close. HDFC, AMC, of course, is the other one, which is up about uh, 12%. UTI, AMC is, is the other one, right? I mean, these stocks were, where well, they started, one and a half, two, two and a half, three percent higher. UTI, AMC is also up eight and a half percent. So this is, I mean, clearly the big, big story of the day in terms of the market reaction. Uh, a hint, but a pretty clear hint from the SEBI chief that, uh, potential relief on the total expense ratio and stocks are reacting uh, big time. Uh, we'll, of course, hear details when that new consultation paper is put out. But for now, these are very large moves on large stocks. Rima. Okay, let's uh, move on then. The RBI released its biannual report on asset quality on Wednesday. The gross NPAs are at near decade lows for the industry. The system-wide gross NPA ratio came in at 3.9% as of March 2023, and RBI stress test projections show that NPL could further decline to 3.6% by March 24. So to talk about the banking uh, industry, the loan growth, the asset quality, we're now joined by Sri Krishnan H., the managing director and the CEO at Karnataka Bank. Um, so before we get chatting about your loan growth, which was subdued in Q4 and how it's picking up in Q1 and hereafter, just a quick word on asset quality. Your gross NPAs were 3.74% as of March. Where do you see it headed by the end of this fiscal year? Good morning. And, uh, you know, thank you for having me on this show. <clears throat> by the way, just uh, to let you know that, you know, I'm just about three weeks uh, old in the bank. Uh, I've just taken charge on 9th of June. And uh, this is, again, you know, non uh, Mangalore, non Kannada person to take over reflects uh, how progressive the board has been and the bank has been. So uh, just to kind of, uh, it's not it's not a disclaimer, but I just want to let you know that, you know, we do have our uh, results coming up, uh, which is the Q1 results, uh, same time next month when I'll be, uh, you know, happy to be on the show uh, to talk about the results. But uh, in a short, uh, you know, kind of an answer to what you asked, Yes, uh, you know, uh, the loan growth and the whole bank has been more uh, traditional and uh, it has been uh, subdued in terms of the growth compared to the market. And which is why uh, there is a new management team that has been put in place. Uh, there is uh, an executive director who is also new to the bank. And uh, there is a, load, a whole lot of uh, work that uh, we are planning to do on repositioning and, uh, you know, creating a new perception about uh, Karnataka Bank uh, to move away from uh, a regional story to a national pan-India level story. If that Could gives you, you a sense of what you're doing. Yeah, uh, Mr. Shri Krishnan, uh, yeah. congratulations on uh, taking over and uh, good morning, Prashant here. Could you uh, good morning. <clears throat> then, because the results are coming up and uh, naturally you can't talk very short term, uh, yeah. but talking slightly longer term smoothens, that, uh, sort of solves that problem. What's the vision, sir, uh, for Karnataka Bank under you? Uh, for, uh, you know, in terms of... So if you can give us a the big numbers that you want to get to? So, good question. So, let me just uh, tell you what we want to do. This is actually the 100th year of the bank. And as I, I walked in, uh, we are actually having centenary celebrations. So, we want to do two things. One is that on the 100th year, we want to have a 100th year startup of the bank, which will be the new uh, bank, uh, uh, you know, more digital, more focused on certain segments, which primarily would be MSME and uh, retail driven. What it means is that uh, today we have uh, regional focus, which is comprising of about 14 economic pockets. And out of that, about seven or eight are in Karnataka and the balance six are outside of Karnataka. So we want to really grow the business uh, across uh, rather than being very inclusive only to Karnataka. That's step number one. Step number two is to uh, enhance the digital delivery and also a digital acquisition, which is a very big thing. So there is a sector focus. There is also a kind of a channel focus that, you know, we will bring about which will uh, contribute to two things. One is accelerated growth on the asset side. And uh, this bank is known for uh, you know, traditional customer service where customers actually swear by uh, the branch uh, service and the excellence that you know is provided. So which means that we need to capitalize on the inherent strengths of the bank. 
the inherent strength of the bank lies in credit evaluation and proposal even at the branch level. So which means that a lot of automation and a lot of digitization that we can do to kind of enhance the bandwidth, as a result, enhance the volumes and uh, the asset growth and uh, the CASA growth is something that, you know, which will be a byproduct of all the efforts. So there is going to be the cash cow, which is the traditional bank running as it is. We are, we are in the process of setting up a digital factory, an analytic factory in uh, Bangalore. And uh, this would consolidate all of the tech operations, delivery, digital analytics, all put together. The bank would be far more out, uh, outward looking compared to what it has been for, for the past 100 years. And while we celebrate our centenary, we'd also mm. be kind of creating a startup and a complete sales culture, you know, in the bank. All right. Good morning, sir. You must be fresh in your role out here, but you have four decades of experience across the banking vertical. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see delivery from year on. Give us a couple of numbers, though, if you, if you could do that. You know, you've clearly told us you want to expand geographically and digital will be a focus as well for you all. But I think the advanced book is closer around 60,000 crores odd. How do you see right. this number growing? You know, if you have a target, say, in the next few years, where do you see this uh, advance number move to, point number one? And also in the near term, that's for FI24, uh, what kind of targets are you working with, both on the loan uh, book as well as on the NIMS, which were quite elevated for your low growth that you delivered in the past quarter? Yeah. So uh, two things. One is that, you know, the asset growth, because of this efforts that, you know, we've just embarked upon, uh, we would believe that, you know, between MSME, retail and uh, a whole lot of other uh, gold and agri loans. And that's one thing that I didn't talk about because the bank has also got lots of strength on the agri. We have over 100 AFOs in the market. And uh, this basically would result in uh, anywhere in the next three years uh, crossing the 100,000 crore mark, uh, which is for sure. That is one. And that's a very, uh, you know, healthy gain. The second is that we need to be supported with some very good metrics on the uh, liability side. And uh, because of which, you know, the healthy NIM, which it is, uh, to sustain this at the same level is something that, you know, we need to focus on. And over the last uh, two, three quarters, I think, you know, there is a significant improvement in the NIM. And we need to kind of at least maintain it at the same level. We are growing with the market, but not necessarily exceeding the market. And that's, I think, you know, the fundamental change that we want to bring about to say that there are those pockets where we can exceed the market in terms of the growth. So which will reflect on the numbers, uh, both the asset as well as the overall balance sheet number. If that kind but, of gives you a sense of where we yeah. are. Think. No, but the NIMS, could you, just the final question before we let you go, the NIMS uh, margin, I mean, the uh, uh, guidance, if you could give us a broadband, last reported number is around 3.87%. So what Correct. do you think that to stabilize was, uh, that? Given the, yeah, go ahead. That was a little bit of uh, an aberration because of certain, uh, you know, uh, clear uh, pricing decision that were taken in the last quarter that was even before, mm -hmm. you know, I had come in. But on a steady state basis, uh, we would, uh, you know, think that, you know, uh, the NIM would settle between anywhere because, you know, as you're aware, the cost of deposits is always yes. a challenge. And, you know, uh, that is something which is going to be, uh, you know, uh, putting an impact uh, on not only us, but all the banks. And uh, so anywhere, uh, you know, a healthy 3.5 to 3.7 is what we would want to maintain. And uh, I think we are quite confident on that. Uh, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much for joining in. Wish you all the very best, uh, you know, in Karnataka Bank's uh, century innings of 2.0. And we'll get chatting when you report your Q1 numbers. We'll um, slip into a break on that note. On the other side, we'll come back and talk technicals with Ish Thakkar. We'll join you.
Okay, welcome back. Uh, 115 points on the Nifty. We're at 19,000 and almost 19,100 for all practical purposes. Mitesh is with us with a quick view of uh, the 45 minutes or an hour of trading that we've had and uh, his fresh recommendations. Mitesh, morning again. I think the trading has been very positive. Both the Nifty and the Bank Nifty look good. Uh, uh, you know, uh, on the stock side, I think uh, the holding finance companies have been doing very well. And uh, uh, we've already had buy calls on uh, uh, LIC housing finance. I think the India Bulls holding finance stock is also picking up very nicely. It's going to go break on. So buy here with the stock at 117 for targets of uh, 128. And the other one is uh, Infosys, which is uh, open with a gap of there. That's a buy with the stock at about levels of uh, 1300 for targets of 1380. Okay, thanks very much, uh, <clears throat> Mitesh. Uh, appreciate you joining in with that. Uh, and uh, that's the view coming in right now. We'll take a quick commercial break here. On the other side, my colleague uh, Lata will get chatting with Manish Chokani of Enam Holdings to talk about the market touching record highs and what to do next. That's the question. Stay tuned. That conversation up next.